Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 147 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, that is Gavin. And Gavin, have you ever felt happy to know that one of your friends is alive? I sure have, uh, because our best good friend, Fia, uh, you know, her she had a tree fall in her yard. I'm alive! Uh, Fia's alive! <laughs> yeah, we could have we could have led with hey Fia. We could have yes, here. we could have led. With <laughs> but you and Manly, yeah, tree fell in her yard, and I'm sure that there were some people out there it just, not getting the impression that I was in t- trying to give. I mean, it slightly damaged her neighbor's house, but you know, yeah. it's fine. Overall, but as long as Fia's okay. okay, that's all I really care about. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I guess put you on a spot. Give us a little little hurricane update. Uh, I know you weren't in town when it happened, but your your fiance and your house were. Yes. Um, how how was Andy in the house other than the tree? Yes. Well, actually, the tree was from the first hurricane, Hurricane Helene. Oh, okay. Yeah, that happened. First hurricane, which wasn't really hyped up as much as Milton. Yeah. And then Milton, everybody was super stressed. Everything's going crazy. And, like, nothing even happened here. We didn't lose power, which we were without power with Helene for a few days. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, there there was... There is nothing really that damaged us. But I am very lucky. A lot of people down south in yeah. the Tampa Bay area are not. And it's still quite a wreckage down there. So, yeah. Um, just counting my blessings. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll have some links down in the show notes as well. Uh, if, you know, just like last time, if you are so inclined, uh, to, to check out some of the, the links to donate, uh, you know, time, or if you live in the area, like how to, you know, volunteer in like a coordinated way, um, with helping some of the cleanup and stuff. So there'll be some links down the show notes for that, uh, as well as lots of other links, because I, I have some in, really f- interesting sources, um, for this episode, because some of it is really hard to visualize, and this is an audio medium, <laughs> um, but we're getting our head of ourselves here. But so, but that'll be the first link in the down in the show notes. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, so it's it's great to hear that that Fia is alive and well, and uh, it's just great to hear your voice, Fia. Yeah, it really is. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's good to hear. With that, we'll too. we'll hear you talk a little more. We'll have uh, some some housekeeping. Okay. <laughs> Fia comes back and we immediately come the back, first thing we make to do is talk about do your chores. talk about what happened, and then the second thing, <laughs> yep. Do the ch- Oh, Gavin, that's sexist. All right, go ahead. (laughs) All right. Don't forget to rate the show on whatever platform you listen to us on and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Give us feedback about the show and any future topics you would like to hear on the pod. And if you'd like to be a guest on the show, be sure to fill out the guest form and all that can be found in the show notes. Gavin, what is our next episode topic? Yeah, so I, I looked back through sort of our our list of episodes. And I'm like, what haven't we done in a while? Because we sort of have a roughly, you know, rotating list of of general themes. You know, we have our our series of, uh, you know, different time periods. Every now and then we talk about a different group of animals uh, or extremely rarely plants. Um, Sometimes we talk about a person. Uh, But we hadn't done uh, an episode about animals in a little while. So we're going to be talking about beetles. I'm just sticking sort of in the, a little bit out of my comfort zone with the invertebrates. Um, beetles, real, real cool. Um, spoiler for two weeks from now, a quarter of all animals, a quarter of all species are beetles. Uh, <laughs> so I'll leave you with that. You can look forward uh, to more about that in two weeks time. Yay. <laughs> awesome. So with the, the house kept, uh, Mike, as our uh, resident high school history teacher, what happened today in history? So, um, today, 1991, October 23rd in history, Gavin, uh, your friend and mine, um, in 1991, Clarence Thomas was sworn oh, in as a, uh, a, as a uh, justice of the United States Supreme Court. He is the longest serving justice currently on the court. Yep. He is 10th all time. 
And uh, he is going to move up that list if he stays on, even for just another like year or so. He's going to start moving in some rarefied air. So, oh um, boy. So like Clarence Thomas, like good on you, well done. Uh, you know, keep going, Clarence. Um, <sighs> who yeah. is this guy? <laughs> oh, you don't know, oh, you don't know my. my boy Clarence? No. So Clarence Thomas. Um, second black justice ever on the Supreme Court, appointed by George H.W. Bush yeah. in 1991. When he got appointed, all of a sudden, there was there were people, one woman in particular, uh, her name was Nita Hill, that was like, yeah, Clarence Thomas sexually harassed me all the time. Oh. Um, like, Clarence Thomas is not a good dude. No. Um, he's also generally considered uh, the most uh, conservative member of the court. On <laughs> yep. Basically, every... Supreme Court ruling that I've paid attention to in, in recent memory, he's been the one that's like, as far to the right as you can possibly take this line of thinking, he's going there. Um, so, for example, I believe he was the only one in the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe versus Wade. Uh, called, the case was Dobbs versus, I think, um, Missouri Women's Jackson Health. Women's Health Jackson Women's Health, yeah. Um, he was the only one, because the the like underlying principle for Roe versus Wade was the right to privacy. And that fundamental principle was also the underlying thing underneath the Supreme court rulings for gay marriage, interracial marriage. Um, and there was a third one in there as well. Um, Oh, uh, sodomy, like, you know, people engaging in, uh, you know, bedroom adult acts with people of the same sex. Um, all of those, share that same underlying principle is that the fundamental constitutional right to privacy. Uh, Justice Thomas was the only one in his writings to be like, hey, all these are next. Uh, notably, except the interracial marriage one. He conveniently left that out because he is in an interracial marriage. Um, so that's that's the one, even though it's the same constitutional principle, he conveniently left that one out of his sights. Um so, yeah, uh, for more on Clarence Thomas, listen to the last, I don't know, probably 10 minutes of, of last episode. Uh, not Oops. a fan. Yeah. Yeah, at the beginning of this, I was making a little joke when I said, Gavin, your friend and mine. I wasn't being serious. I was making yeah, yes. I see. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. There was like a little hint, hint, wink, wink there. If you're in the know, you're in the know. Um, but now He's the joke also... explained. Yeah, Clarence Thomas. <laughs> That He's part also was been a joke, though. He's investigated been there for, a while. for various types of corruption, taking uh, lavish trips from uh, billionaires and such. Uh, who have his wife tried to overthrow the government? Yep, that too. Um, okay, yeah. not a fan. Today in history. So thanks yes. for that, Mike. Uh, <laughs> you are welcome. <sighs> with that, with my blood pressure up, uh, <laughs> uh, Fia, what do we got for seagrass corner? All right, so for Seagrass Corner today, I wanted to talk about the speckled trout, or spotted sea trout, or specks. Ooh. Scientific name, Cynoscoin nebulosus. Uh, Sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> this is a common estuary fish in the South U.S., and it can be found along the Gulf Coast and Atlantic coast from Maryland to Florida. Um, you know, as for seagrass corner, this speckled trout does like its shallow grassy flats. So it is a, a good seagrass fish. Um, but it's really, uh, it can be commercially fished, but it's, I would say probably bigger for recreational fisheries. Um, this is definitely something that Ever since I moved to the south, is like this and redfish are like the fish you get you go to catch. Um, okay. Yeah. So fun fact about speckled trout is they move offshore to deeper waters during colder months, but then they move back to the um, estuaries and coastal areas during the spring and summer. Is that a is that like a breeding thing? Um, I didn't look that closely into it, but okay. Uh, if I had to make an assumption, it would either be breeding or, uh, coldness. <laughs> okay. 
probably just might get too cold for them in the shallow waters. Gotcha. But to be determined. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then as for what they eat, the smaller trout really like to eat a lot of shrimps and crustaceans. But as they grow larger, their diets shift towards fish and specifically larger fish. And so diet shifts um, from the smaller like juvenile to adult fish is called an ontogenetic shift, I think is what it's called. Yep. And that's just for all types of fish. Yeah, that's uh fish do that really well. Vertebra or like uh, I guess tetrapods do that a little less well. Uh, we t- like typically call typically call that kind of thing niche partitioning, mm-hmm. where it's like the adults do something different than the juveniles because yeah. then the if they were competing with each other, the adults would just you know beat out the juveniles all the time because they're you know adults. Exactly. Um, so yeah, fish, you know. Starting starting that strong, way back in in yonder times, uh, I yeah. I assume as well. Right. Um. Yeah. Whenever I think of trout, I think of there's a lot of really good trout fishing. I don't really fish much myself. Um. But in uh like the Adirondacks and in Central New York, there's a lot of really good trout fishing. Um. Whenever mm-hmm. I tell people I'm from Central New York, they ask me about it, and I'm surprised. Yeah. Um. <laughs> because I don't think of fish. When I think of Central New York, personally, um, yeah, yeah, I think of salt and uh, chicken riggies. That's mm. what I think of. Utica <laughs> greens. Exactly. Nice. Um, awesome. Well, thank you for that, Fia. Uh, so we're moving on to our main topic for today, which is storms, and uh, that is sort of a, a purposefully uh, vague title. Uh, because, as you may or may not be aware, there are all sorts of storms that happen all over the world, all the time. Are we going to talk about all different types of storms today? Yes. No, oh. <laughs> no that I would mean, be... I think you're a coward if we're not going to. No, that would oh. be a, a much, much too long uh, episode. So That's a whole podcast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or, in fact, a... Uh, Arguably unscientific Discovery Channel show, uh, Storm mm. Chasers. <laughs> I'm kind of liking the idea here of us having a spinoff podcast called You Could Be Dead, The Storms That Might Kill You. <laughs> I like it. Uh, you know, networks, hit us up. We will sell you that for $5. <laughs> that way we will come out net positive. And we will still have lost money on the show overall. Oh, no. Okay, so how, uh, $30, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> Um, but no, today, instead of talking about the, the whole gamut of storms, we're going to be focusing on uh, one, or depending on how you count it, two types of storms, uh, namely hurricanes and typhoons. Um, why? Why those two, or one in particular? Uh, firstly, as we mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, it's topical. Uh, we just had two very large hurricanes hit the United States um, that, you know, caused a lot of ruckus, you know, many people lost their lives, uh, did many millions to billions of dollars in, in damage. Um, and there's also another one that is just about to hit or just hit, uh, the Bahamas and Cuba as well. Um, and secondly, more importantly for this podcast, uh, they have the best chance to make it into the rock record due to where and how they happen. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. So, what is a hurricane slash typhoon slash tropical storm slash tropical depression slash tropical cyclone slash cyclone? Those are all names for basically the same thing. Really? Yeah. Apparently, we just call them different names when they happen in different places. Um. Uh when they form in the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico or on the Pacific coast of the U S and Canada, because they also happen over there. Uh, we call them hurricanes. Basically everywhere else that storms like this happen, including places like Japan, China, the Philippines, 
uh, in other parts of sort of the Indo-Pacific, uh, they call them typhoons. But for all intents and purposes, they are functionally the same. They're a spinning storm formed from heat in the ocean and a low pressure system, which we'll get more into exactly how hurricanes and, and typhoons and things form. But just know if you've ever heard of like typhoons or um, tropical cyclones, those are the same thing as what most people in the U.S. would call a hurricane. So one caveat of that, I will say, yeah, um, is that I know we use tropical storm or tropical depression when it like it's based on a it, scale right. of wind speed. So like hurricanes have higher wind speed than a tropical storm. Right. But a tropical storm is like the but umbrella it, yes, term. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, uh, all hurricanes are tropical storms. Not all tropical storms are hurricanes. Exactly. Yeah. They do the same thing, just at different wind speeds. Right. And so why are they called? Uh, they're broadly, so like if, for example, uh, as we talked about on the sort of spotlight episode we did, uh, with the Common Descent podcast, when I do the research for these episodes, uh, I typically start with Wikipedia as a springboard. And for the most part, uh, there is a Wikipedia page for hurricanes, but the broader, more encompassing one is tropical cyclones. That is sort of the biggest, broadest umbrella term for all of these types of storm systems. Um, and so why are they called tropical cyclones? Um, we'll get into sort of how they form in, in just a little bit, but basically they form in warm waters, hence tropical, and they have sort of a low pressure zone in the center that causes the air around them to spin in a circle and that uh, around that sort of low pressure zone, hence cyclone, they spin in a circle. And these storms are uh, really common around the world. Um, we only hear about maybe three or four per year here in the U.S. Um, because many of them don't make landfall in the continental U.S., but they still happen. Um, we really only hear about the big ones like Helene or Milton. And maybe that's slightly different for somebody who lives in Florida, for example. Um, but for someone who lives in Pennsylvania, uh, if I hear anything else about a hurricane or tropical storm for the rest of this year, I will be surprised. And uh, like, like I mentioned, th so those are just sort of two storms. But just by the names, we can tell that others have happened in between them, even though those two were only like a week, week and a half apart. Um, we name tropical storms uh, in alphabetical order. For the ones in the Atlantic, it only goes A to W for whatever reason. It doesn't go to Z. <laughs> huh. Um. And so Hurricanes Helene and Milton were only about a week apart, but yet they're five letters apart in the alphabet. So Tropical Storms Isaac, Joyce, Kirk, and Leslie happened in between them. Wow. But, but you probably didn't hear about those because they just formed, got a, you know high enough wind speeds to be called a tropical storm, and then either didn't make landfall or, you know... More, probably more likely didn't make landfall in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's also different lists. So like each year they put out the full list of names. They don't sort of name them as they go. So they have uh, the full list for, I think, up until 2029. Whoa. Uh, for the Atlantic. But That's they have different lists. Yeah. Um, they have different lists for different regions. So, like I said, those are just, you know, Helene, Milton, Isaac, those are just the ones, the Atlantic Basin. In the northeastern Pacific, that has its own list of names. And there's another one uh, for the Central Pacific, uh, which I was, you know, delighted to learn, uh, is made up mostly of uh, indigenous Pacific Islander names, which is cool. I like mm. that. Yeah. Uh, but overall, all around the world, there's... 80 to 90 tropical storms that happen each year that get strong enough to get named. Uh, so these are not, you know, rare events in and of themselves. So how do storms like this form? 
And it's a little bit more complicated than this. But for the most part, you need two things. You need warm water and low pressure. I'm going to do my best here to make this as simple as possible. <laughs> you got this, Gavin. But anything with the atmosphere is so wildly complicated. So it, please, if you have questions or something I say doesn't make sense, please ask me. Or, or just, and then Gavin will go talk to somebody else that knows something. Or we will make a cut and I will do a Google. Um, because I, I think I wrote it in a way that makes sense to me. Um, but that does not always work for other people. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so basically, as I hope most people know, when water gets warm, it evaporates. With me so far. Yes. Warmer bodies of water evaporate more. As that yes. water evaporates, it rises up into the atmosphere, just like warm air does. As it rises, it sort of cools because the upper atmosphere is cold. And then it condenses. What was that? Is that condensation? Yes. Once it gets cold, it then condenses and forms okay. clouds. Okay. Uh, and that so far is, is pretty basic weather stuff. Water gets warm, evaporates, rises, condenses into clouds. And then this next part is where it gets a bit more complicated. Um, it gets a lot more complicated than we're actually going to talk about here. But sometimes these clouds can sort of group together. And if enough of them sort of form together, they can start to spin. This is mostly due to how the atmosphere interacts with the Earth's rotation. Are we Whoa. talking about the Coriolis effect here, or is it something Yes. Else? Okay. This is new to me. So, imagine... Say, say, have you ever seen somebody spin a basketball on their finger? Yes. The air around that basketball doesn't really move, or like spin with the ball, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm -hmm. air, air doesn't really have a lot of friction to it. So it's hard to get the air to move around something that is spinning. Earth's gravity keeps it close to the Earth, but it doesn't spin nicely along with the Earth like Earth's water does, for example, because water is, you know, so many more times denser than air. Um, yeah. So the air in the atmosphere does not spin nicely along with the Earth as it spins. And I because see. of that, that makes some weird stuff happen with the atmosphere. I gotcha. Um, and the Cori Coriolis effect is sort of tangential to that. Um, the Coriolis effect basically is like, so imagine you have like a thumbtack in the basketball that someone's spinning on their finger. If you take it out and then put it back down while the ball is spinning, it's not going to go back down where it was. Even yeah. though you didn't move the thumbtack, you know, laterally or, or at all. You just, yeah, you yeah. know, out and then back in. The earth spun, the earth being the basketball in this, you know, analogy, spun underneath it. Okay. And therefore, it the, the right. pin moved yeah. relative to where it was. Uh, so it's almost like a lag. Like... Yeah. Hmm. And, and that spinning. lag... Yeah. Yeah, that, that lag causes some weird things in the atmosphere. Okay. Um, and it's it's sort of this quirk, uh, among many other things, but this is one of the main drivers of it. But the, this quirk of how the spinning Earth interacts with the atmosphere is what causes a lot of high-pressure and low-pressure areas in the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are, that's one of the things is just sort of those weird quirks that cause high pressure and low pressure. Sometimes those can be in relatively predictable areas. Um, for example, if there's just a really hot zone that causes a lot of air to rise, that means like at the surface, there is low pressure because the air that was there is, is moving away from it, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. So that's one of the ingredients, low pressure. Uh, these also only happen over water. Hurricanes cannot form over, you know, continental land masses. There's not enough water uh, and not enough heat generally there for them. Um, Is it possible for, um, for like that water to be taken up from an ocean or something um, and then as it's coming up, move over to land and have a hurricane form over land um, that way, just because it, where it formed happened to be right near a um, a landmass, or is that just not something that's ever going to happen? Yeah, that's land? that's just not something that I yeah. that that I've read that ever really happens. And we'll talk about so sort of the physics of it in a little bit, mm-hmm. um, not in detail, just like concepts. Um, but basically, to continue to keep the storm going and spinning requires a lot of energy. And Mm -hmm. the amount of energy that it can pick up over water is much higher than it can pick up over land. Right. So that's why basically any tropical storm that makes landfall almost instantly slows way down, dumps a bunch of its water, and then, um, you know, doesn't make it all that far inland. Um, At least as a, you know, tropical storm with the wind speeds that make it a tropical storm. Hurricane Helene was kind of weird with how far it carried a lot of its water inland. That's that's very unusual. That doesn't happen a lot. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, so we'll talk about that just sort of energy input output in a little bit. Um, so yeah, those are the two main things. Heat over water and low pressure. There's a couple other sort of minor ingredients. Um, you need things like a low wind shear. Which is like so, so wind at the surface moving at you know the same speed as like wind high up in the atmosphere. Um, that way, sort of the cyclone doesn't sort of spread itself too thin. Um, you need high humidity in, in the sort of lower atmosphere to help keep all the water there. Um, and then I didn't see this described in detail, but it just said disturbances in the atmosphere. Take from that what you will. Um, so those are those kind of the ingredients. Um, weather's very complicated, <laughs> <laughs> and there's there is a lot of physics that I don't understand. Um, I took two semesters of physics in college, and I semi frequently skipped class in one of them. Um, <laughs> phys- physics is not my jam, so. Take my word for it, or look it up yourself. There was a lot of math on the stuff that I read, but I did not understand it. Yeah. Um, anyway, as these storms travel, for example, like if we think of Milton, just because that's you know in a lot of people's consciousness, you know, because it's recent and was and was big. It started sort of just off the Yucatan Peninsula on the western side of the Gulf of Mexico, and so. As it sort of moved east across the Gulf, um, it continued to pick up energy from whatever is underneath them. Um, If there is a large stretch of warm water like the Gulf of Mexico, it will continue to gain energy from all of that heat. Because at the end of the day, that's that's what heat is. Heat is just another word for energy as far as physics is concerned. Uh, And then I have in parentheses, Mm -hmm. I actually paid attention in that semester. Um, so yeah from a physics point of view that's all heat is is just um oh, measuring how quickly different molecules in a given area uh, are moving around in their space um so warm water has a lot of energy and that energy can just get sort of sucked up into this storm cycle um and that's why like I, like we talked about a little bit ago Hurricanes almost always get significantly weaker shortly after making landfall. Um, yeah. Keeping everything moving just requires a lot of energy in the system. And when it hits land, it's just, it is still getting some heat energy from the land, but it's way less than the water. And it's way less than it takes to continue that system going. Um, so it's just like, you know, 
it is then net negative in its like in energy intake, basically. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's sort of what these storms are and how they form. Any any questions so far? No, I think that makes sense. I don't think so. Yeah, we're rolling so far. Cool. So we are give or take thirty minutes into this episode. How does any of this relate to paleontology in any way at all? <laughs> I was gonna ignore that question actually. I was just gonna <laughs> let you cook and then like maybe talk with you about it afterwards, but okay. So we're no, coming there, back to our roots. There are some ways, yes. Um so storms, as you might imagine, are not a new thing on planet Earth. Earth has been spinning for a bit over 4 billion years. And we've had a significant amount of liquid water for most of that time. Um, and presumably, we have had these kinds of tropical storms for pretty much all of that time. Um, they probably worked a bit differently through time as the amounts of different gases in the atmosphere sort of changed. Like early on, there was almost no oxygen in the atmosphere, but there was lots of CO2, uh, which, pro- which you know made Earth really warm which probably made those hurricanes really, really big. Um, but those different like density changes, I, I didn't really see even anything. I'm sure that there are models out there, uh, particularly given uh, increasing CO2 in the foreseeable future. Um, I'm sure that those models exist. I couldn't really find them for, you know, way back in, in Earth's ancient past. I couldn't really find models for that. Gavin, um, can you please say that again? Increasing CO2 in the foreseeable future. Okay, cool. That I really like that phrase as a get around to telling people about climate change. <laughs> yeah. So, and this is also really important why like climate modeling like this is, is important because from everything that I've seen, Increased CO2 in the atmosphere doesn't make hurricanes happen more frequently, but it does make them much stronger. Yeah. Because there's just more heat. There's yes. more energy for them to suck up. Correct. Um, and so that's that's really what we're sort of looking at for the future with, with hurricanes and these other types of typhoons and, and tropical storms. Uh, but yeah, so we we it, I think it's like fairly common sense if you were to like stop and think about it for a minute that these storms almost certainly happened throughout pretty much all of Earth's history. So how do we find out anything about these storms in the past, um, especially given that today they only last, you know, a day, maybe two. Uh, you know, at least once once they make landfall. Um, Mm -hmm. so how could something so short lived make it into the quote fossil record? You know, it's not life, so it doesn't leave a fossil record, but into the sort of the geologic record. Um, and almost certainly most don't, (laughs) um, all, but all of the various kinds of weather events, uh, of any kind of storm that you can think of these tropical cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, whichever you'd like to call them are probably one of the more likely to show up in the rock record for a couple of reasons. Um, Firstly, they happen in the ocean, which is nice because that's where most rock deposition happens, Uh, especially in shallow oceans, which tend to be warmer than the really, really deep oceans. Um, You know, I'm sure tornadoes, for example, happened in the ancient past, but finding one in the rock record would be extremely unlikely because they happen on land, typically in pretty flat areas uh, that don't have a lot of deposition happening. Uh, And in order for us to find something millions of years later, it needs to be deposited. So if you were to ask any, you know, geologist, did the dinosaurs see tornadoes? Yeah, almost certainly. Um, But we have, no way really to to find that's the main reason why we're talking about this t- today at all is because this is like one of the few kinds of storms that we actually can see in the rocks mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of cool to be like you know 
you're taking away like the cost of hurricane stuff, like the fact that you can see, yeah, you know, just a weather event in, uh, you know, in the rock, like that's kind of awesome. Yeah, it's it is really cool, and especially like going out to outcrops, and that that's a very common sort of intro or, or i guess depending on you know your, how intensive your your program is maybe an upper level class depending um but just g- having your teacher take you in the in the class out to an outcrop and just say all right figure out what happened <laughs> what <laughs> what is the lesson you tell me um and we'll we'll talk about how you recognize it in the rocks but like putting it together um that's a very classic sort of geology lab. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's the main reason we're talking about these storms today is because it's one of the few that is like even a little likely to be preserved in the rock record. Um, but secondly, also, we know very clearly what to look for in the rocks because we know how they turn up modern sediments. So by mm. looking at the aftermath, and how it sort of shakes up the sediment in particular ways, we can then look for that same patterns that these make today in the rocks from 100, 300, 400 million years ago. So what exactly do these storms do to the areas that they move through? Uh, Firstly, floods. That is just sort of a given. They make a ton of rain. Um, but that's not necessarily indicative of a big storm like this because, you know, you could have a river, like the Mississippi floods all the time, pretty well inland. Um, so that's not necessarily indicative, but is, you know, a very frequent side effect of storms like these. The most easily recognizable things in the rock record for storms like this are the storm surge and something that I don't think it's talked about nearly enough, the reverse storm surge. Hmm. It, it's clearly not talked about enough because I'm not sure if I've ever heard that before. Okay, wait. Yeah. Let me think. Is that like when you find like fossils of terrestrial things in like ocean areas because of like the drift back? Yes and no. Um, okay. it, it's much more recognizable just in the sediment patterns than oh, fossils okay. per se. Yeah. Um, maybe drift back is the technical, or I guess the the sort of more colloquial term for it. But we'll, we'll talk about each of these sort of in, in turn. Okay. So in the Northern Hemisphere, these storms spin counterclockwise. In the Southern Hemisphere, they spin clockwise. Fun. So if you think back to, if, if you paid attention to the news about Hurricane Milton at all, picture the storm on the west coast of Florida, so still in the Gulf. If you picture sort of the top-down view of these storms, the southern side of the storm's circle, the wind is blowing to the uh, to the east. I might have had that backwards. Storms spin... Yes. Okay. Yeah, wind blowing to the east if, uh, if it's coming from the west at the bottom of the storm circle. Mm-hmm. In those areas... That constant, fast-moving wind blows a lot of water up onto the land. That's called storm surge. That's why you see a lot of flooding, not just because of the rain, but because that it is constant, fast-moving wind in a single direction that literally just blows a bunch of ocean water up onto land. That is storm surge. This causes a lot of marine sediment carried by that water to be pushed up onto land. The water brings a bunch of the sand and stuff from the beach with it. Um, And so after the storm passes and the water retreats, the terrestrial sediment sort of gets deposited back on top of it like normal. And so you see this pattern in the rocks where we see the terrestrial sediments that are normally there covered by a big wave of marine sediments and then covered again back by the normal terrestrial sediments. That's cool. Yeah. And then there's the reverse storm surge, which is kind of exactly what it sounds like. If you picture the storm again, so the south side, the the wind is blowing to the east, toward Florida. 
on the north side of the storm, the wind is blowing to the west, out into the gulf. And just like that strong, persistent wind in one direction blows a bunch of water up onto land in the storm surge, for a reverse storm surge, it blows a bunch of water away from shore so that there will be miles of seafloor that is completely exposed. There is no water on top of them. Damn. I've never thought of that. That seems, that seems like really bad and also kind of cool. It is ex- extremely dangerous because some people are dumb and think, hey, this is cool. I'm going to go walk on that. I'd be one of those people. I'd be like, I'll never get this opportunity again. Which, like, is kind of true. But when the storm starts to dissipate, that water comes back extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. And so even if you are, you know, half a mile offshore, which is pretty easy to to walk pretty quickly, you know, Mm -hmm. that's not unreasonable for a person to just walk that far. Um, You would be... Tens of feet underwater. Normally. And so there is that much water coming back at you. And th- this is a thing that kills people pretty regularly during these storms. Because people go out and walk on this new mi- you know, couple miles of beach that weren't there before. And then mm-hmm. they get buried and drown. Fun times. Um, <laughs> but just like the storm surge leaves a particular sediment signature, the reverse storm surge also does. Um, so it basically, you have the, your, your seafloor, and it's less that, you know, terrestrial sediments get blown in on top of it. Less of that, but it's more that you see a very recognizable break in, like, uh, like, a, like a discontinuity between the normal seafloor sediment and, and then seafloor sedimentation when the water comes back. There's like mm-hmm. a very notable sort. We call it a gap, even though there's not like a physical gap there. It's like a gap in time is what that represents. Hmm. Um, and so those are things that you look for when you're looking for, you know, ancient storms, basically. Um, there's also lots of things that we call sedimentary structures. Uh, that are indicative of, you know, turbulent waters often caused by storms. The most common one you'll see, if you were to Google, if, if you are this persuasion of nerd, uh, to <laughs> Google sedimentary structure from storms, uh, you'll will, the first one that will come up is called hummocky cross stratification. Once again, oh. I recognize this is an audio medium. And these descriptions probably will not be helpful. There will be some <laughs> links down in the show notes. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll do my best. So normally, sediments are sort of deposited horizontally in beds, is what we call that. Um, sometimes if there's flow in a single direction, like a river, or like uh, sand dunes where the, the wind is usually blowing in a you know, specific direction, there will be ripples or dunes um, that are asymmetrical in shape. If you've ever, you know, been to like a sandy creek or a river, um, you've probably seen those. Uh, In places like a beach, where there's flow sort of back and forth, where it's not in a single constant direction, ripples still form, but they are symmetrical. In places where there are storms... These beds and ripples during the storm get a bit more complicated and sort of cut through one another when big storm waves come through. So they form almost like a big S or like a, like a sideways stretched out S shape, more or less, um, instead of like a nice uh, sort of ripple that you might see in like a fine grained sand beach. Mm-hmm. Uh, these hummocky cross stratifications are evidence that these big waves, uh, you know, came through, turned up the sediment in this specific way that only really happens today in storms. Um, and there's even some convenient math 
to uh, help us out here that I had honestly kind of forgotten about until, uh, you know, doing some research for this episode. So based on observing modern waves, we know how deep into the water the energy from waves reach. For example, if waves have a length of about 10 feet, they only reach about 5 feet down into the water. Hmm. Yeah. It's very convenient uh, that it just had the, the physics works out that it's half. So you can back math the, like, historical exactly storms in the fossils. Yeah. Hmm. Because we can tell with, with a pretty good amount of accuracy how deep the, the water was in any given, you know, body of sediment. Um, mostly by things like uh, grain size, you know, it's like t- more toward the beach. You have larger grains of sand. As you get further out into the ocean from the beach, the grain sizes get smaller and smaller until in the really deep water, it's just like clay and silt. Um and that's that's a usually a very good proxy for how deep the water was. So if we can tell just by looking at the the grain size of the of the sediment, hey, these rocks were fifty feet below the water. There must have been at least hundred foot long waves to turn them up in this way. And those really only happen in big storms. Yeah. Yeah, so like you said, doing doing sort of the backwards math is, is a good way to put that. That's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other types of sedimentary structures that happen when the water moves quickly, either back into the water from a storm surge or back to its normal place from a reverse storm surge. Um, this sort of rips up the sediment a little bit if the sediment was already a little bit more compact. Um, or sometimes, you know, a, a bigger rock or something that it wouldn't normally be around, that kind of sediment will sort of make a groove through uh, sort of the, the finer grain sediment. And mm-hmm. you can see that. We call those groove casts. Um, and again, to move something that big, takes a lot more energy than is usually found in 50 foot deep water. So we can tell that from this kind of thing, there must have been uh, some kind of storm or something like that to input enough energy to move the sediment in this way. So do you know what like the biggest back mathed her like storm has been in the geological record? That is an excellent question. I do not. Oh, dang. That'd be cool. Um, I I would imagine it wouldn't be all that dissimilar to today. There are other things that, like, there, there are some records of, like, tsunamis. Yeah. Which are, are different. Yeah. So one that's like we're pretty confident is from a storm. I don't know. Um, there's some like speculative evidence about like the tsunami that formed from when the uh, Chicxulub impact happened, the one at the end of the Cretaceous that killed the dinosaurs, because that landed in the ocean. Mm-hmm. Um, so that probably made one hell of a tsunami. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's speculative evidence of the tsunami that, you know, happened from that. Um, that whole site has kind of been mired in controversy because the person working on it lied about some other stuff. Um, so yeah. Anyway, long story short, no, I don't have a a number (laughs) for you. Okay. No worries. Um, but yeah, so even with all of that, with how common, these storms are generally around the world. You know, almost a hundred of them happen around the world every year. So, like, you know, through deep time, millions to billions of these storms have happened. Um, even with us knowing more or less exactly what to look for in the rocks to find them, 
Uh, it probably won't surprise you to learn that these are still very rare to actually find mm -hmm. uh, in the rock record. For starters, most of the time that these storms are around, they're over open ocean, where even if they're turning up really big waves, uh, they will not leave any trace at all on the seafloor below them just because it's too deep. Even like a relatively shallow part of the ocean, like the Gulf of Mexico, you know, if you're like way out in like the center of the Gulf, it really doesn't matter how big of a wave a storm is making. It's not reaching all the way to the bottom. Okay. Um, and then also, as we mentioned, they only last a, a few days, like the whole span from when Milton formed to when it made it across Florida was like less than a week which yeah. obviously in geologic times is nothing. Um, that being said, we do have them in quite a lot of places, um, but they're hard to sort of research from like a layperson perspective, trying to do r the writing for this episode, because we, it's not like we give these ancient storms names. <laughs> so th <laughs> there are some hummocky cross stratifications known here in central Pennsylvania, um, but it's hard to Google exactly you know anything about them other than just like we have them you mm -hmm. know um mm -hmm. so clearly there was a storm here at some point when these rocks were deposited which was uh you know sometime in the devonian period sometime you know almost 400 million years ago uh they are very well known though throughout sort of the center central areas of the united states places like kansas utah new mexico South Dakota, Montana, um, and those are all from the Cretaceous period. Because then, uh, there was a giant seaway that stretched all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up through northern Canada that cut North America basically in two, where there was, you know, an environment very similar to the Gulf of Mexico, but stretched all the way, you know, north to south through North America. Yeah. Um, and so that was a great little, like, alleyway for hurricanes to form. So that's sort of what hurricanes are, how we find them in the rocks. And I want to end off with talking about storms and evolution. Because as you, you know, it's something that I'm sure nobody besides uber nerds like myself think about. Um, with it being something that is so common in the world, you know, give or take a hundred times per year, these things happen. Um, they probably have like a, a decent size impact on the evolution of the animals that are found in the, you know, regions where these happen. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for Fia, most of the information <laughs> I was able to find about this was about terrestrial things uh, on islands. <laughs> yeah. So while I am positive, they do have an impact on like near shore in uh, invertebrate environments um i was not really able to find that <laughs> well you might find yeah, so maybe, out next year yeah yeah that'd be uh an interesting thing to uh to you know do a part two on eventually with uh yeah. you know looking at how how seagrasses you know handle storms and stuff right i'm curious to see like after these big storms like they both hit my research area yeah so uh, i'm curious to see if there's going to be differences between like spring sampling of last year versus the or this coming year is yeah. that something you expect to find for you um i'm not really sure you know i haven't really ever thought about hurricanes in research before until i arrived here mm -hmm. so um i mean it makes sense now that yeah. you think about it yeah. yeah you think about it so yeah maybe it could it depends on if it i think it depends if it changed like like the abiotic factors or like the habitat structure. Right. So uh, we'll see. But yeah, so what we'll talk about here is again, very vertebrate biased shocker for this podcast. I know. <laughs> um, so there are a number of studies done on animals today to sort of understand how the storms impact evolution of different animals uh, that are impacted by these storms. Um, and so the research, like I said, has mostly been on islands, though, which is still kind of interesting to me just because I think island ecosystems are neat. Um, it's a little limited 
in its use for like the long term scheme of paleontology, since islands tend to be relatively short lived in like you know geologic timescales, uh, with a couple of very notable exceptions like Madagascar and Australia. Um, but these studies sort of help give some context to just how catastrophic events in general uh, shape evolution. And so the, the one that I want to highlight is one that I remember hearing about at the time. Uh, there was a 2020 study, uh, this will be down in the show notes too, uh, by Colin Donahue et al. Uh, that looked at anoles, which are, if you've ever been to Florida or anywhere in the Caribbean, they are the little lizards, um, mostly green, uh, that hang out basically everywhere on trees, on uh, like little retaining walls and stuff. They are everywhere. There's so many at my house. They're very cute. I love them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, also called anoles, if you've heard that as well. I, I yeah, think technically that's I the correct them. term is anole, but it, mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter. Um, and so not only are these found basically everywhere in the southeast U.S., they are found on basically every island in the Caribbean, as well as, you know, the, the northern-ish parts of South America. Um, and so this study showed that the population that was that they were looking at after two major hurricanes had significantly longer forelimbs and toe pads than the average size that was measured before the storms. Hmm. So basically, Evolution. yeah, uh, the storms came through and killed off a bunch of them that had shorter arms, basically, and smaller toe pads, which are kind of like gecko toe pads. It just helps them cling to stuff. Um, and so they basically tested, OK, is this just a fluke or is is there actually something to this? So basically, they took a bunch of these lizards and put them on fake trees inside of wind tunnels. Uh and blew hurricane force winds at them. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and as you would probably expect, uh, the bigger toe pads and longer arms helped them hang on uh, during stronger winds than the ones without those features. And then the researchers were like, cool, uh, sort of proof of concept done. Uh, let's go out and, and try to use this in a predictive way, which is... Uh, at the end of the day, sort of the goal for most science is to be able to make predictions and then go out and observe those predictions correctly. That's kind of the whole scientific method. Um, yeah. And so they went and looked for a species that they didn't have like those nice measurements for before storms, like they did with that uh, one species of, of an Oli. So they uh, went and looked at just a different species found uh, around the Bahamas. And then they looked at storm records for 12 islands in the Bahamas to see how many times each island had been hit by a large storm over the last 70 years. So long, longer timescales. And on the islands that had the most storms, the Anoles there had bigger toe pads and longer arms than those on the islands with fewer hurricanes. Hmm. Uh, that and makes then sense. again with yeah with again their proof of concept once again sort of confirmed they then expanded their study to over 180 species of anoles across the entire caribbean region from the u.s down to brazil wow because yes this is a very diverse group of lizards um uh, mm-hmm. and this was pretty much the case universally not just wow. sort of from one population to another within the same species but from species to species, species that lived in an area that got hit by storms more frequently had proportionally longer arms and bigger toe pads. I love when science works. Yeah, this is, you know, this is exactly how you would like science to work. Uh, right. You make an observation. From that, you make a hypothesis uh, that potentially explains that. Then you go out and test it. By making more observations. Um, and in this case, the hypothesis turned out to be correct. So um, there they, there hasn't been a, a follow-up paper yet, but in, in the paper, the authors uh, said that they want to start looking into animals besides lizards <laughs> to see how they're affected by these storms. Um, I think it also is, is just convenient that 
the, this particular group of lizards all have this yeah. same the, the grippy toe pad adaptation that helps them cling to stuff and it was a you know if you can hang on in the wind better you're probably more likely to not die in the storm um so you know each group of animals that they look at is going to have their own unique things like that um and to just see how it's uh, affecting these animals going forward so you know you can use this to sort of make interpretations and sort of this is just an example of how these catastrophic events select for you know certain traits and so things in the fossil record were like wow why why does why is does this anole have such long arms mm-hmm. um you know this could be a potential reason that's just you know an example but um i'm sure that there are other you know you know semi you know frequent catastrophic environments you know think of like volcanic eruptions on like volcanic islands or something like that or um you know other natural disaster prone areas to how different animals might adapt to those so uh, this was just a really cool study that i thought was uh neat and just a cool way to highlight you know how science works in general yeah Um, and you said you were going to put the link to this paper in the show notes uh yes okay cool yeah, I definitely want to. Um, I will. I will do my best to find the open source version of it. My, yeah. I was doing this like on my lunch break uh, at work, and like my work computer just kind of logs me into a lot of stuff to get papers because I work at a university. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But I think I don't think it was open source, but I don't think it was like hidden, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I will. I will. I have lots of stuff to put in the show notes. So the first one in the show notes will be you know links to sort of. Uh, help out with the hurricane relief stuff uh, but then the rest will be some some stuff about you know uh, some visuals to help with uh, you know visualizing some of these you know sedimentary structures and things that, uh, that I talked about uh, and then the the link to this paper as well awesome so that's that's all I got that's uh that's hurricanes and uh, and or tropical cyclones and or typhoons <laughs> And fingers crossed that you're right that we won't be hearing about uh, too many more of these guy things Man, for the rest I of hope. this year at least. I yeah. hope so. Um, yeah, we gotta. We want to keep Fia right where she is. Yes. Yeah. I am tired of being stressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing a PhD. I don't know how well that's gonna work for you. Okay, more stressed than I already am every day. <laughs> uh, and we'll return uh, in two weeks to see just how stressed Fia is. <laughs> on episode 148, but in the meantime, this has been episode 147 of I Wish You Were Dead, the podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, that was Gavin. Fia was able to make it today, and we were all happy to hear her. Take care, everybody. Bye. Hello, everybody. This is just a uh, quick little reward for making it all the way through the episode. Uh, We had to pause recording at one point, and uh, Mike and I just sort of kept talking. Uh, and didn't pause recording. So this is just a little treat of uh, banter that doesn't normally make it into the episode for making it all the way to the end. So uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Until then, take care. Yeah, um, so I'm going to need to take a pause here really quick because I forgot to take my medicine, and I have to take it now or I will get severe heartburn. Yeah, go for it. So I'll be right back. Look at the timestamp to cut this, I guess. Yeah, uh, Yeah, just keep your recording going. Should we continue the podcast without Fia? No, she just got back. I don't know. I mean, like, what do they say? Like, never leave a man behind. But if a woman has to take medicine, then it, the podcast must continue, is I think the way the saying goes. You know, the very famous Mike Bryson 2024 saying. You know, the... um. Uh, like that uh, thing from The Office where it's like, uh, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott. Of course. So at my office at work, I've got Hi, thing. Hi, Fia. It says, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott, Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby. And it's pictured Jack Ruby shooting Lee Harvey Oswald below, right below that. Jesus. Hi, Fia. Yes, we, we can hear you. Wait, can you? Because I can't hear her. There she is. She's back. This episode of I Wish You Were Dead was written by Gavin Davidson and hosted by Gavin Davidson, Mike Bryson, and Fenella Campanino. 
It was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson. Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you. 